Welcome back. We're going to be looking at axial members and uh, introduction to shape functions. And uh, again, we'll talk about shape functions and what they are as we move through the presentation. But I uh, just want to highlight uh, the next presentation we'll be examining um, the general loading of structural members, so things that are static and machine components, things that are dynamically moving, but specifically looking at the push pull and the bending of those machine components. Uh, so that's where we're headed. Uh, we'll do a look at some of that today, but not all of it first aspect of that. Uh, torsion, by the way, we'll examine that later, further on down the line. Uh, if you're wondering where that is in the next three lectures, it'll be coming up. All right, so let's look into this and see what we got. So if we look at linear elements, we can see we have linear elements in axial loading. Uh, an example here is if we have a couple different floors and some vertical members supporting um, these different floors, this column. And we can assume central axial loading, there's no bending here, it's hopefully not going from side to side, uh, just straight up and down. We could load it like this. So we have different forces that the, that the different floors are applying on this column. So force um, at node 4, at node 3, node 2, and uh, nothing at node 1 besides the weight of the column. And then we have different elements between those things, 1, 2, and, and 3. All right. So how can we look at this? All right, let's uh, develop an individual. Uh, axial elements, so again, one element at a time. So they'll have nodes I and J as, as normal. And at least in this particular orientation, we have, um, they're in the global Y, YI and YJ. So it's the global locations of those nodes. There's going to be nodal deflections at both those nodes, and those will be represented by the capital U. And then there's the length that we have between those two nodes, and that length is equal to the difference in the uh, the y components at node j and node i. So we can actually determine what that L value is. All right, so let's solve for some unknown deflection. If we actually want to figure out what the deflection is between some nodes, let's see how we can figure that out. If we assume a linear deflection distribution, so it's linear, keyword there, all right? So straight line, if it's linear, then we have to have the form of y equals mx plus b. Let's see what we get here. So y in our case is going to be the deflection u. Uh, X is going to be our Y, so where are we at in the element is what Y is telling us. And then we have C2 is essentially our slope, and B is our Y-intercept. Right, so that's we're maintaining that form here. All right, so the deflection, again, it's the deflection at any point Y within the element. So this is any point within the element, between nodes I and J of our element. All right, so with two unknown in the equation, we've got C1 with C2. We need two equations. So two equations, two unknowns. Or two, two unknowns, two equations. I guess you say in the reverse there. Um, so we're going to say we have some deflection uh, U uh, equals UI at this location Y equals YI. So at node I, we have this deflection. So here's YI. We substitute in there when we have the deflection there at node I. All right. Again, the deflection we have um, is some deflection at J is at that location. So we're substituting uh, location Y sub J and the deflection that occurs at that point, at that node. All right, so there are two equations. So we can solve simultaneously and get uh, what C1 is equal to and C2. So we got our two constants. Now we can plug those back in to our original equation for the displacement. So now... If we know the location right, of our two nodes, so here's node J and here's node I, et cetera, et cetera, then we can put in some location between those two and we can solve for what that deflection is. Right, that's pretty neat. So again, C1 is our Y intercept. Right, so here's MX plus B, this is B right here, and MX, here's X, and this is M. So M is the slope. So C2 is our slope and C1 is our Y intercept. All right, so let's rearrange this equation, the pre equation we had on the previous slide. And we're now going to solve it in terms of ui and uj. So here's the first, first equation. We're going to break that out into ui and uj. And the second equation, the slope, as it were, um, we're going to break that out into uj and ui again. All right, now let's collect those terms. So we're going to collect all the terms that have ui in them right here and right here. So we're going to collect those terms, and this becomes this equation. And we do the same thing for uj. And we're going to define the terms in the parentheses here. So this term here is SI, and this term here is SJ. 
S sub J. All right, and these are very, very key things going forward. All right. The SI and SJ are called our shape functions. They literally describe the shape or the deflection of each element. We use these shape functions to figure out what the deflection is at any point between two nodes. Hence the name shape functions. All right. So if we know what L is, back from the, uh, with the first slide where we define our problem, our length of our element is defined by the, the difference between the Y components at each node. And we can substitute that into the denominator and come up with our shape functions for a node I is YJ minus Y over L. And for the shape function at node J is Y minus YI over L. All right. So therefore, if we plug the shape functions back into our um, original equation, we can now have the shape functions, so SI times UI and SJ times UJ. Right, so this is happening, what stuff is happening in node i and stuff happening in node j, and that defines what the deflection is in our element. All right, so again, I'm just going to re rehash this many times. This is the deflection at any point within the element. So the U, and the U superscript either, the deflection at any point within our element. So in matrix form, if we wanted to write this, we could take our shape function in node i, shape function in node j, so this is kind of a uh, there's a row matrix, and then we have our deflections here. Not really clear here. There should be a space between these two, um, but just FYI. But if we take this row, multiply times this column, we basically recreate this equation up here. All right, the same approach can be used to approximate the variation of any unknown variable, such as temperature and velocity. So we can come back, and we'll be doing this later, but we'll substitute in, instead of using displacement, we'll use temperature. And we'll have temperatures over here. So knowing these two temperatures at two different ends of our element, we can solve for the temperature within the element. All right, so we'll come back to that. All right, so let's look at the uh, local coordinate system. So we notice that Y starts at node I. So here's Y. So here's our local coordinate system. This is, again, over here. This is the global system for Y. So if that's the case, uh, capital Y, right, the, the, the uh, location at any point within our element is equal to Y sub I, plus y will give us any point within our element. So that's where that comes from. So that describes that. We can substitute that now into our shape function. So here's the original shape function with the, uh, the length of our uh, element. So substituting into for the y variable, the location any point within our element, we're going to substitute in our function up here that we just derived. All right. Solving for, we're going to bring the uh, two global coordinates together. Oh, what does that look like? Y sub J minus Y sub I, that's the same as this guy right here. That's the length. So let's substitute in that. We're going to get L minus Y over L. Let's do the same thing for the uh, shape function node J. So we'll start off substituting for a Y here. There's the substitution. We're going to collect, oh, collect terms here. This is a positive. This one's minus YI. That means they go away. All right, so we're left with, let me do that a little bit faster. So that's this is going to be, that's going to go to zero. All right, so we got the shape function node i, 1 minus y over l. So just kind of rearranging there again. And sj is equal to y over l. All right, so notice that y, it goes from 0 to l. Anything beyond that doesn't really make sense. So y is somewhere between 0 and l, which is good, because that's what we're wanting for a local coordinate system. And also see that if, we, uh, if we're at node, uh, node i, so... When we're at node i, y is equal to 0 at node i. So if we plug in 0 here, we get 1 minus 0, and that just gives us 1. So the shape function is 1 at node i, and the shape function um, for node i right, is 0 at node j. So if we plug in y equal to l up here, so we get 1 minus l over l, that's 1. So 1 minus 1 is 0. So we get the shape function is 1 at its own node. And that same shape function is 0 at the other node. Right. Likewise, shape function node j is 0 at node i. But the shape function for node j is 1 at node j. Right. So notice those different ones. At its own node, it's 1. When it's at another node, or at least this, at node i, it's 0. This is a key, um, a key identifier. Um, property of our shape functions. And we'll, we'll hit that again later. 
All right, so let's look at our stiffnesses, uh, develop our stiffness matrix and load matrices for axial loaded members using the minimum total potential energy formulation. All right, so I don't think I have a presentation on this yet, but there will be one up very soon. Um, actually, <laughs> very soon, be in the next couple of months. So check for it, um, should be there soon. All right, so what we need to do to, to accomplish the minimum total potential energy is to look at the strain energy. All right, so the strain energy is we do a integration of a, over the volume of our stress times the strain over two, there would be as our volume. From Hooke's law, we know we can substitute in for the stress, our modulus times the uh, strain, so then we get the modulus times strain squared. All right, so the total potential energy for a body in a closed system is the strain energy minus the external work that has been done. That's the total potential energy. So for a body with n elements, right, one, two, three, in this case, m nodes, one, two, three, four, right, this becomes n, so e is equal to one, so e is here, which, how many elements, so from one to n, total number of elements, and then i for our node numbers, from one node one up to uh, node m. All right, generic form there. So the system will reach equilibrium where the potential energy is at its minimum. To find the minimum, we'll set the we'll find the differential and set it equal to zero. All right, so we're going to differentiate our strain energy, differentiate our work, and set it to equal to zero and figure out when that occurs. All right, so let's do that. So we got our um, our equation here for the deflection in terms of our shape functions. All right. We need to get this into our, our strain energy equation. To do that, we need to look at from mechanics materials. Remember that if we, the strain is the change in length over uh, x, so what we're going to use is, in our case, the deflection over the change in y. All right, so let's do that. So we're going to differentiate our function here of the displacement and differentiate it with respect to y, and that's why we're going to substitute in our shape functions, which have the terms y here and here. All right, so let's do that. So here's the differentiation. We're going to substitute in for u. Here's our u function. We're going to differentiate with that with respect to y. All right, after we put in the shape functions. All right, so we put in the shape functions so we can differentiate with respect to y. And we do that and reduce. And we come up with the strain is equal to the negative of the deflection in node i plus the deflection in node j all over l. L being the original uh, length of our uh, element. This may be this may look familiar. Keep following along. You may have already guessed what's going on here. All right, so we're going to substitute back into our strain energy equation because we now have our strain in terms of something we can use here. Um, that's going to remain constant. It's not a, uh, not a uh, function of volume. So off the volume, it's going to be the cross-sectional area times the length of our element. So we substitute that in for the volume bring in our strain equation we just solved for in the previous slide. So minus ui plus uj over l. So we've got to square that. And squaring that out, we get our function here for the strain energy. Right, that looks good. Now we need to minimize, minimize our strain energy. So we're going to have to take the differential with respect to displacement. And we have two nodes. So we have to do this both at node i, and we'll do it at node j here in the second half of the slide. So just looking at node i, we're going to differentiate with respect to node i. So this guy is going to go to 0, and then we'll have uh, 2uj and 2ui left over there. So there are those guys, uj and ui. All right. Get, um, get the 2s to cancel out. All right. So that's a reduced down form. I'll do it at node j. So now we're going to differentiate with respect to node j here, differentiate with respect to node j. So this guy is going to 2uj, here we got 2ui as a result of this differentiation, and that guy's going to go to 0. Okay, so there we go. Again, the 2s get uh, canceled out there, and we're left with our reduced form of a e over l, uj minus ui. All right, so that's our minimized strain energy there. Now let's look at our external work. So external work is just the force being applied to the node times the deflection at that node. And then we want to differentiate that with respect to u sub i. And in our first case, uh, node i, it's going to be just the force at node i. And 
it would be the same thing for u at node j as well. All right, so if we put this in matrix form, all right, here's the, uh, this is minimum total potential energy. So here's our functions from before. So we got um, uh, strain energy differentiated with respect to ui, differentiated with respect to no, the deflection at node j. All right, and there are force functions. So just uh, the one we have up here at, up, up top here at node i, and here's the one at node j and equals our forces at node i and node j. All right, so we're going to bring all those together. So look at the total, um, minimum total potential energy uh, equation in matrix form. So here's the total differentiation of the potential energy equation, or the minimization, sorry, of the total potential energy equation. Uh, we have our minimization of the strain energy, and we have our minimization of the force. All right, so substitute those in equations from the previous slide. Right. Hopefully this is looking real familiar right about now. So we said if K, i.e. a spring constant, stiffness constant, we substitute in for A over L, then our stiffness equation becomes K times the matrix 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1, UI over UJ, or UI, UJ, the column matrix there, uh, forces, right? So we applied the mem total potential energy function to axial members, and we found that they act in the same manner as trusses, which hopefully is not a surprise because the axial members were, at least what we, the case we looked at was two force member, just like trusses were. And so we, we end up with the same results there. All right, so let's apply this to example. So we have uh, 30 kips being applied up here at the node four on the third floor, 20 kips on the second floor, 10 kips. Uh, from the first floor, being applied at node 2, 10 feet spacing between each. We've got a modulus of 30 times 10 to the 6th psi and the area of cross-sectional area of 20 inches squared. So we're going to find the vertical displacements of each floor level and also look at the stress in each portion of the column. All right, so we'll start out with the element stiffness matrix, which we just derived, right, AE over L. All right, so we plug in our cross-sectional area modulus over L, L being 10 feet, and we got to make sure our, our units stay consistent, so multiply that times 12 to get that into inches. So we get 5 times 10 to the 6 uh, pounds per inch. So plugging that back in, and we see that in our stiffness is in all these cases because the lengths are the same, the cross-sectional area is the same, the modulus is the same, so all these stiffness um, matrices are all the same. So this is the element stiffness matrix local coordinates. Actually, it's in global coordinates. They're all aligned in this case, but it's the element uh, version of that. Uh, we bring all those elements into our global stiffness matrix. So we've seen how to apply that in the previous videos. Uh, we got our global force matrix. So the force being applied uh, at node 1 is 0, and then we got our negative 10 kips, negative 20 kips, and negative 30 kips for force at node 4. Set up our matrix equation there. Apply a boundary condition. We know there's no deflection at uh, node 1 because that's in contact with the ground, so we don't expect that to deflect at all. So we'll call that 0. So put 1 in that column, 0 is in the rest. In this case, it was 1 anyway, but uh, note that if it wasn't, we'd have to apply 1 there. So solving with MathCAD or MATLAB, you should come up with these deflections. Um, at our different nodes in our beam, or in our column, rather. All right, so let's look at our axial stresses now. So we've got the deflections. Let's go back and calculate the axial stress. So the axial stress is going to be the force over area, and that reduces to the modulus times the change in length based on the displacements at node i and j over L. So uh, for element 1, we got uh, the 30 times 10 to the 6 psi. Uh, the negative 0 0.014 inches that node J reflects in element 1 and 0 at node 1 doesn't move. And the overall length of 120 inches gives us negative 3,500 PSI in compression. So the C is just put on there because we have a negative sign out front. Um, that's why we can call it compression. So we do that for element 2. And we see we have negative 2,500 PSI in compression there. So a little bit less, and then for element three, negative 1,500 PSI in compression there. 
Let's then move on to a second example, or just extending the example we were just on. We got the same column, we got the same load, the same elements and nodes. Everything's the same except for, right? We have and we have all the deflections that we have saw from before. What we're going to do now is we're going to find the deflection at node A. All right, so this is not what we actually saw for. We saw for one, two, three, and four, but not node A. So how am I going to get node A? The deflection of node A. Well, we came with that equation, right? The shape function is describe the shape of the deflection in our elements. So we just have to come back and apply those in this situation. All right, so let's do that. So here's our, uh, our equation. So we have the deflection in some element is equal to the shape function at node I times the displacement at node I plus the shape function at node J times the, de the deflection at node J. So let's put in those equations there for our shape functions. We put in our shape function equations. Right. And we're going to put in the actual values now. So we're looking at element 3, and that's made up of node J is um, node 4, and node I is node 3. So that's where those guys come from, and likewise J is 4 and I is 3. All right. So substituting our values there, the uh, global Y to get to node 4. So this is the global Y, not the lowercase y within the element. It's the global Y. So it's 360 inches to get to node 4, 100 or 240 inches to get to node 3. Again, we have the length of our elements here, 120 inches, 120 inches. And then deflections, this is what we saw for in the previous problem. So the deflection at node 3 is negative 0 0.024, and the deflection at node 4 is negative 0 0.03 inches. So now we just have to solve this problem out once we put in where we want to find it. So where is node A at? So node A is at 300 inches. In this case, it was halfway between, uh, almost halfway between, I don't know, halfway between, halfway between nodes uh, 3 and 4. So we plug in 300 inches there and 300 inches here. And now we can run the whole calculation and we come up with the deflection is negative 0 0.027 inches at node A. Now, this is a linear case. So you could probably say, I could have just done the average between node 3 and node 4. And you're right, because it's linear, you could have just done the average between the two. And you would have gotten uh, negative 0 0.027. But there's other cases where the shape function actually won't be linear. And it'll be helpful to have this set up to, to solve that. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Again, put any uh, comments, questions below. Uh, in the in that comment section of the video and uh, be happy to respond to those and uh, hope to see you in the next video. Thanks.